Um, we just want to especially thank you for coming to a special service here where, as you know, um, having a special service for Micah. Um, usually people dedicate their babies pretty early on. <laughs> the reason why we've delayed is because we really wanted to have it here at our church. And uh, some of you may know that we started this church plan in February. Um, and so, you know, February we started and then in May we were going away to the U.S. for his first birthday. So we couldn't have it then. And so we, we tried to have it as soon as we could. And so um, even though he's already one years old, um, we are very excited that we could have today's Christian service. We want to thank um, everyone for coming. Um, we really, really appreciate the fact that you're here to support us. Um, and we also want to welcome you to the exchange if this is your first time. We always have this program on Saturdays. I'm not always dressed like this. Um, so to explain, we are American, but we're Korean American. So our parents are Korean, and I was actually born in Korea. And in Korean culture, whenever there's a special occasion, um, this is what the women wear. So you have a little twirl. <laughs> um, I will try very hard not to step on my dress. And unfortunately, I actually like hold on to one end. So don't expect me to go anywhere too fast. Um, please help me not trip over myself, because I already dropped last night. That was but um, I actually want to, speaking of last night, introduce two very special people to you. And that's actually James and Sam. Now, they didn't know that I was going to embarrass them, but I am. So if you can just come up very briefly, um, Sam and James got baptized last night. Um, and so they're officially, they already are, but officially part of our church family. So let's give them a round of applause. Um, so yeah, that, a very special weekend. And so um, they uh, were baptized last night in our Christian church. And we're very excited that um, we get to continue to see how they contribute to our church because they're such a big blessing. Um, in addition to, to this weekend being special, the next few weekends are going to be very special because next weekend and the weekend after, we're having an evangelistic series. Um, so if you remember Pastor Anthony McPherson, who spoke here once several months ago, he's our guest uh, speaker. And he's going to be going through a series called uh, Evil is God to Blame. It's a problem of pain is God to Blame. And basically those six um, topics um, are all listed in the bulletin. Um, I hope you got a bulletin today. If you didn't, you can go to melbournecityadvents.org, our website, and it lists the different topics for each day dealing with the problem of pain. It is, uh, is God to blame? What is he doing about it? What has he done about it? What is he going to do about it? And I think it would be a great opportunity for you to bring your friends. Um, it's going to be explored from a Christian worldview, but uh, there will be opportunity to um, really explore together. Um, so please check out our website, please invite your friends, and there will be supper or dinner provided. Um, it'll be Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, and then the following weekend, Friday night, Saturday afternoon, and Saturday evening. So please mark your calendars, please come, bring your friends. Um, also, we also have small groups on Friday nights, usually, um, but we will not be having them <coughs> the next two weekends because we have the event series, and they'll be right here on, at Padre Collins Street. Speaking of which, I want to introduce a very special guest today. Uh, where is he seated? Derek is... Oh, there you are. Can you... We've been talking about you so much. Could you, Derek owns this place, and let's just use this place. Can we just give him a round of applause? Coming. I think this is your first time uh, here, so uh, we're very excited that you get to see uh, what we do here. Um, last but not least, I just want to um, explain this packet. So we wanted everyone to have one of these today. Um, they're in the back, so after the service, go pick yourself one. And basically, it's just, um, it's called a memory verse pack, but I guess you could also use it as a uh, you know, put your business cards in. But what we would like for you to do is write down, there's empty cards in there for you to write down your favorite Bible verses that you've always wanted to memorize. Um, write them in there, and it just um, has Micah 6, 8 on it, and it's the verse from which we need Micah. Um, and there's also some Korean candy, so you can experiment to see <laughs> um, which ones are which. Two of them are good, one of them is bad, but we'll let you figure out which one. <laughs> we, we all looked when we bought them and realized not all of them are good. But anyways, um, so they're in the back, so please help yourself. Today's theme is, you know, some of the Korean food in the back um, will be Korean. Some others um, were prepared by Auntie Patty. Um, and I also promptly forgot, like, all the apples and oranges that I bought for this occasion. So, yeah, sorry about that. But, um, yeah. So just a couple of uh, house 
items. Uh, for those of you who are wondering where the toilets are located, uh, from the area that you walked in from to the reception area, there's a toilet on either side. If you're facing the lifts, the women's uh, restroom is on the right-hand side, the men's restroom is on the left-hand side. And so if you're ever wondering, that's where the toilets are located. Uh, also, there's a boardroom right next to us. And for those of you who have little ones, uh, such as Micah, there's a change table in there in case you have to change nappies. Um, so during the week, it's a boardroom, and on the weekend, it's a different room. But, uh, so thank you, Derek. <laughs> um, one, one last thing. We want to uh, welcome Pastor Paul Katenko, and we want to thank him for taking the afternoon out to spending time with us. And I think he had a business meeting at another church that uh, was taking place, and he specifically um, organized it so the business meeting would take place another weekend, and he was kind enough to come here uh, to dedicate Micah for us. And so we really want to thank, thank you, Paul, and uh, your wife, uh, Myung Tamanim, for, for coming with us. And um, I should probably introduce, well, I'll let you introduce your wife while, while you come to the front. But um, thank you so much for coming and welcome. So at this time, um, we're just going to show a slideshow. Um, of my dad's life, and then um, we'll continue. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you. 
great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever
Good to be here this afternoon, and especially for a very special occasion, uh, the dedication of Little Micah. Uh, my name's Paul Gatanga, my wife I was supposed to introduce, she's up the back there, Miyong, do you want to stand up? That's for my wife Miyong Gatanga. <laughs> so maybe you can see why Roy and Jinha asked me to dedicate their child, so Korean connection there. <laughs> Have you ever been tempted to make a deal with God? Have you ever been tempted to make a deal with God? Maybe have you attempted to or thought about it? Sometimes when things aren't going well or sometimes when we're in a difficult situation, we might think, well, maybe if I do something for God or if God does something for me, uh, I'll do something in return for him. I'll go back to church, I'll serve him, I'll dedicate him, whatever, whatever. It's often out of desperation that sometimes we will contemplate at least asking God to do something for us and we do something in return. Now to find out more about this, uh, this question or this topic, I turned what we do nowadays to the internet. I actually found on Yahoo Answers the answer to this question. There was two of them, actually. I want to make a deal with God was uh, the title. And uh, this person put out this question on Yahoo Answers. I want to wish for my dad to get a new job that will make him rich again and for me to move to a state like New York or a place where it snows a lot. And I can start over with school. I want to move next year. What do you think I should give in return? I'll pay up first. I'd, I know God doesn't ask for deals, but I get a better chance to get my dream come true. Update, I already made many deals with him. When I was young and childish, I made a deal with him for some heavy snow days, and there were like two every week. I have made other deals, and they worked. This is what a person put on uh, Yahoo. This was the best answer which they chose. You don't have to make deals with God for him to answer your prayers. All you need to do is serve him and have faith that he hears and will answer your prayers. God is not a game player or deal maker. He is your heavenly father and loves you. Keep the faith and let us know when he answers and where you'll be moving to. You won't get prayers answered by calling people bad names. Ignore the negative people. What they think doesn't matter. It is what you believe that matters. There was another one, though, that was a little, more, a little more serious there on Yahoo Answers. It went like this. Is it stupid to make a deal with God? That's what the, the heading of this uh, question was. Is it stupid to make a deal with God? Now, I must admit, I can't even really understand it properly, but it was the person just pouring out their heart in some ways. I'll just read it to you. I'm just struggling every day about a current situation. I can't deal with it anymore. I'm tired of thinking about it. I just want it gone and off my mind. If I pray to God or the universe or whatever is the highest power, can I say, please take this stress away from me and I will leave it up to fate? It is whether or not to move away and leave the only man I've ever loved. We're not together. We're not together. The deal is to say, if it doesn't come back to me by September when I leave, then it's not meant to be, question mark. Do you think God could hear me and give me a break, do the deal? I'm sorry if this sounds retarded. I'm just sick of this. Uh, cry from the heart. And Yahoo Answers. There are people asking about deals with God on Yahoo Answers. The best answer, which this person chose, don't worry, trust God, ask him to help you with his spirit. And then the person put John 14, which talks about trusting in God. Making deals with God. It's probably something, now this uh, sermon is not really you know, a theological sermon about you know, whether we should or shouldn't make deals with God. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because this dedication service has its origins in one person's deal with God. 
and that's the significance of this. The person in question is Hannah, and Hannah was in a difficult situation. Her husband um, had another another wife, which was you know, in Bible times uh, acceptable. Hannah was the first wife and the one who was in the privileged position, or should have been. But the problem was, Hannah had no children, and the rival wife had children. And the rival wife would be needling her, and needling her, and making life miserable for her. Maybe like this person who wrote on Yahoo Answers, I just wanted to go away. I can't cope, I just wanted to go away. And so year after year, uh, Hannah, uh, had this uh, this person always on their case, always needling them, always putting them down, because she had the children, and Hannah didn't. If you have your Bibles there, you can turn to First Samuel, chapter one. We're not going to read the whole story. I've given you some of the background. So yeah, this uh, lady is in desperate. Desperately wanting to have a baby and that happens today too as we know some people would like to have children and can't Okay, let's have a look. We'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses 9 to 11 Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh Hannah stood up now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and, vow- and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, and then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. So yeah, out of desperation, Year after year of desiring a baby, uh, this lady, this uh, lady Hannah, she made a deal with God. And this deal was, you give me a son and I will dedicate him to you for the rest of his life. He will be for you. Wow. What would you do if you were God and somebody uh, is asking you to do this? Well, as time went on, In uh, verses 19 and 20, early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So yeah, she made a deal with God and God answered her prayer. And so it goes uh, down to verses 24 to 28. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an elaf of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, who was the priest, the high priest. And she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. So this lady who desperately wanted a son, she made the deal with God, and she fulfilled her vow. When she received the son, she took him to the temple and gave him to the high priest to work Uh, in the church or to work in the temple all of his life. And this is the basis of a dedication service, Uh, what happened here. Now, of course, there's a few differences. Um, Roy and uh, Jin Ha, they won't be giving him to the pastor of another church or anything like that. Um, I've certainly got enough kids, I don't need any more. Um, so, but they will be dedicating him. And I'll be explaining a bit about what it means uh, in a modern way uh, to be dedicating our children to God. But this is the basic story. Uh, out of frustration, out of desperation, a lady made a deal with God. 
And look, you know, not every deal works out. Um, you know, in some ways, we must be trusting in God uh, rather than making deals. But in this case, um, the deal was answered and she fulfilled her vow. And so Samuel was dedicated and he was handed over to the temple to be brought up and to work for God there in the you know, what was the house of worship back in those days. <clears throat> so yeah, this is Hannah's deal with God. Hannah's deal with God. What about Jesus? What does Jesus think of little children? When Jesus was on the earth, he had only about three and a half years to fulfill his mission. He was an important person. And he was a busy person as well. But at, so, at one time, uh, some <laughs> women came with their children to Jesus. And uh, the people who were around Jesus, sort of what uh, they considered themselves um, uh, his gatekeepers, you know, his minders, uh, that's what they thought they were. They wanted to shoo the children away, shoo the mothers and the children away. You know, Jesus was far too important, far too busy in their minds, in their minds to have time for children. Let's go to Luke 18, 15 to 17. Luke 18, verses 15 to 17. It says, The people were bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Jesus made time for the mothers and their children. Even though he was an important man, he was also a very humble man. And he always had time for people and also for children as well. Jesus is not someone who's only interested in adults, but is interested in the children as well. Roy and Jin Ha, you're dedicating Micah. Uh, to the Lord. And in some ways, we as parents, we are a child's first impression of God. Uh, in some ways, we are God to our children. Uh, quite interesting when they are young. What do our children think of a God because of us? That's something that we need to consider. What sort of people are we? What sort of view of God do our children get from us? There was a, uh, a search institute study of 10,000 Christian youth. And what they found was quite interesting. It found that uh, if children see God as being restrictive, always out to catch them out, you know, sort of a judge you know, looking down his nose at people, then these Christian young people were more likely to have you know, not such good outcomes you know, in life. Yeah, they, they would have low sense of self-worth, be prejudiced against people of other races and sexes, have alcohol, more alcohol and more drug abuse. Very interesting, just from their picture of God. That's what made the difference. But if they saw God as a liberal God, liberal meaning you know, liberal in love and forgiveness, okay, it correlated with a high sense of self-worth, a positive attitude toward the church, accepting traditional standards, and a high achievement motivation, as well as low alcohol and drug abuse. It all came back to the view of God uh, that made the difference. And that view of God was shaped uh, by the parents in some ways. And so uh, many adults, they sometimes have difficulty in accepting Jesus or accepting God because of bad experiences growing up in their own family. And if you start talking about God the Father, oh man, don't even talk about fathers for some people uh, or have had unfortunate experiences with adults, then they can they have a very negative view uh, about God uh, later on in life. And so as uh, Roy and Jin Ha, as you dedicate Micah, uh, in some ways, or in many ways, dedicating a baby is actually dedicating themselves to bring up Micah and to give him a positive view of God. There's a saying, small boys learn to be large men 
in the presence of large men who care about small boys. Say it again. Small boys learn to be large men in the presence of large men who care about small boys. And yeah, sometimes when we're adults, sometimes yeah, the kids, the little ones especially, yeah, we don't pay too much attention to them. But yeah, it makes a big difference in the lives of our little ones, the things that we say and do. There's a bit of a theory uh, doing the rounds that um, we shouldn't push our religion onto children and that parents should um, you know, give children or little ones a broad exposure to all sorts of different philosophies and religions and then when they grow up uh, then they'll choose on their own uh, which way they will go, what they'll believe or not believe or you know, anything at all. This is something that's uh, doing the rounds a little bit. Um, you know, even in some Christian families, they sort of feel, oh, no, we're not pushing our Christianity onto a child. We're going to let them decide you know, what they want to do. Well, anyway, I've tried this theory out on my own uh, garden in the backyard, and I can tell you the results are not good. <laughs> if we let our gardens have the same way as this theory of bringing up children, Okay, the gardens get overgrown with weeds, things go all over the place. Okay, when it comes to our children, we are to be training them. Okay, let's go to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Okay, 26, 22nd chapter of Proverbs and the 6th verse. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. <coughs> the Bible tells us we ought to train our children when they are young. That is a responsibility of being a parent, in fact. Uh, and so, yeah, we are asked to do that. And part of training up the child is in the Christian way. It is in presenting God to them. You know, trying to make God as attractive to them as possible. That is what we want to be doing as parents. This is part of the training that, uh, that they have. It also says that when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, as we know from experience, um, you know, sometimes children do wander away uh, from God. And maybe some of you here have had that experience as well. I know that uh, this church has people who have uh, gone different paths uh, in their uh, Christianity. So maybe some of you have also uh, maybe had some devi other terms in your Christian experience from what you brought up, what you were brought up with. But still, our upbringing makes a difference uh, in a ways that perhaps we don't even we don't even know. I've got a, uh, an older brother, and um, he, he we were all brought up as Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, but he, uh, he left the church you know, for uh, whatever reasons. Um, you know, still hope and pray he'll come back, but yeah, he's uh, left the church. Um, but anyway, he, uh, he did his apprenticeship down here, then he went up to Mount Isa. Uh, he wanted to work in the mines. He hated Melbourne weather, so he decided to buy a one-way ticket to Mount Isa. Uh, and he did. He went to Mount Isa uh, to get a job in the mines. Uh, and, he, and he found a job in the mines. And anyway, um, at one stage he met up with a, a lady who took him in as a boarder. And uh, she was very kind to him, uh, very good, sort of almost like a mother to him. You know, he was uh, low, young, uh, in his low 20s, uh, just gone up to a new place uh, as a miner. You know, he was uh, certainly out of the church at, at this point. Um, but anyway, he, over the years, he kept in contact with this lady and um, probably about, oh, about 20 years after she first um, you know, took him in, uh, she said something you know, very, very interesting to him. And you know, on one of his trips down here, he actually shared it with us uh, you know, in, a, in, a family, you know, in a family dinner. Um, this lady said, um, she actually saw him you know, in the pub. Uh, he was in the pub and drinking and you know, whatever you do in the pub. And um, <coughs> she, said, she said to him, as I say, about 20 years later, she said, I still remember 
When I saw you in the pub, I looked at you and I could tell you had a good upbringing. <laughs> and this shocked my brother. He sort of thought, now yeah, I've put the church behind me. I've put all of that stuff behind me. Yet this lady, you know, out of all the people you know, in the pub, you know, she, he couldn't hide his upbringing and his background. Uh, very interesting. It was very interesting. And yeah, he told us, he told all of us a, you know, a little bit sheepish look on his face. Um, but yeah, we found it very interesting that uh, you know, those things didn't depart from him. They'll say, you know, he's not back at church or anything like that. But yeah, that background, it still sticks with us, um, even whether we like it or not. Training a child begins you know, almost immediately. In fact, those first few years are crucial. Uh, anyone who's had a child will, will know that. Uh, at the, when, the younger they are, the more open they are um, to influences uh, from us as parents. More, uh, more easily, you know, more easily to be moulded when they're younger. Uh, so Micah, he's yeah, he's a young boy now, and this is the stage where you know, he's really you know, going to be developing uh, his character. Okay, by age three, a child's basic personality is established by about age three. By age six, the child's brain is almost the size of an adult's brain. So the brain is almost fully grown, you know, physically. And by age seven, the child's pretty much a miniature of what it's going to be as an adult. Now, of course, they change and all of that sort of thing. But that's sort of roughly uh, how, how things work. We teach our children by instruction and example. Okay, examples, the, you know, the crucial thing. Now we sometimes see that our children is like a mirror being held up in front of us. And sometimes we don't like what we see. Now I've got two kids and I find the things that annoy me most is the things that I do. <laughs> That's the things that annoy me about them because they say, oh no, they're repeating the same things <laughs> and the same things I wish I could change. Now, they've sort of caught it somehow. So, you know, that's how it is you know, with kids. They, they learn a lot by precept and example. And none of us are perfect, okay? None of us are perfect parents. None of us are perfect people. But, yeah, our example, uh, how we relate to our children, how we relate to each other, uh, our children will pick up on these things. Children love bedtime stories, so that's a good opportunity, you know, Roy and Jin Ha. Uh, to spend time with the children. I remember uh, almost every night, oh, probably for about the first seven or eight years, I would lie down in bed with my two boys and just read, read to them. Um, so yeah, that's a good time for instruction. Maintaining a good relationship. We have a good relationship with our children. They are more open to accept the things that we say. So yeah, that's absolutely vital for them. Uh, a good relationship with our children. And say none of us are perfect. Uh, we all do our best. We all want our best for our children. And so, yeah, there's some things that could maybe help us to that. Encourage a relationship with God. At any age, this can happen. Uh, you can start you know, when they're old enough, at least put their hands together for prayer at the table. You know, it's one thing to start. They might know what prayer is, might not be able to talk, but yeah, just to say, okay, hands together. Just something like that, to introduce them to God. And then, of course, as time goes on, can give more instruction. Now, more specifically on to Micah. Micah Hajun Kim is his name. Born the 10th of May, 2013. The meaning of Micah is, who is like God? That's the meaning of uh, Micah. Who is like God? A uh, very good name, isn't it? Who is like God? Micah also has a Korean name too, Hajun. Hajun, which means preparing for heaven. Good name, isn't it? <laughs> Korean names all have meanings. And um, you know, it's not like Joe or Bob or Paul. <laughs> they have meanings. And so <coughs> Hajun means uh, preparing for heaven. Uh, I was asking uh, the other night about the names of um, you know, Roy and Jinha and uh, Roy's father as well, the meaning of those. Uh, Roy's Korean name is Uiho, and that means righteous. 
Okay, so the parents gave that name. Uh, Jinha means true water. Okay, Christ is the true and living water. That's what her name means. Um, Alex Kim, his green name is uh, Jehok, and that means having light. So this is a you know, spiritual family uh, with a spiritual uh, background. And so they're desiring to, you know, for that to continue uh, in their son, uh, Micah Hajun. Micah was a prophet whose ministry was in the latter half of the 8th century BC. And uh, Micah was, he was a bit of a younger man and he sort of lived in the shadow uh, in some ways of an older prophet, Isaiah. Okay, and Isaiah, he's one of the, you know, he's one of the big guns uh, in, the, in the Bible when it comes to being a prophet. And so in some ways, Micah was a little bit you know, in his shadow, sort of the younger guy. Um, and also there was quite a difference between Isaiah and Micah in terms of background and social standing. The differences were quite immense. Isaiah was a nobleman. He was a confidant, a confidant of kings and statesmen. And Isaiah was a very high-level uh, prophet. Um, the language of his books, of, of his uh, book, Isaiah, is very refined uh, that he uses. Micah, however, was a peasant farmer or landowner. Now, not many Koreans are going to like that for their child <laughs> to be a, um, a peasant farmer or landowner. And I mean, not just Koreans, probably none of us would want our children to say, I want to be a peasant. That's what I want to grow up to be. Well, this was Micah. God called Micah, even in this lowly position. And so Micah's style in uh, his prophecy, it's only a short book. Uh, it's rugged, simple, forceful and clear. The prophet Micah, he protested against the religious and social corruption of his countrymen. Now, he was a real prophet. He saw the evil around him and God uh, inspired him to speak against uh, the evil that was around, both in the religious field and the social field. Micah's denunciation of oppression and exploitation of the poor and underprivileged marked the conviction and vehemence of the one who identifies with their lot. So we understand by the way Micah talked that he, was, he could identify uh, with the people you know, who were sort of the lowly and oppressed. He is bold, stern and uncompromising in dealing with sin, yet tender of heart, regretfully sorrowful in spirit, loving and sympathetic. This was Micah. This was Micah, who he is named <coughs> after. So yeah, certainly, you know, uh, maybe only a small book in the Bible, but, he, but he's a major player uh, in what he did. And uh, on the, the card... Uh, Jin Ha alluded to that uh, the text uh, that, will, that will be on that is Isaiah, Micah 6 verse 8. This is one of actually the famous texts in the Bible. I'll read it to you. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of, require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Pretty nice summary of the Christian walk, isn't it? Okay, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And this is what uh, Roy and Jin Ha are desiring of Micah, that he will live this kind of life. So this is the most famous verse there. Okay, now is uh, Micah ready for the dedication? Okay. Dedication's always dicey of <laughs> dealing with children. So, yeah, we just go with the flow. We just go with the flow. The title of this sermon is Giving Our Children Back to God. Okay? <coughs> and through this service, uh, Roy and Jin Ha, they want to dedicate a Micah to God. Now, they're not going to, you know, dump him at the local synagogue or local church or anything like that. Uh, for the priest or whatever to bring him up. But instead, what it means is that they commit, they're committing to training Micah for God. Okay? 
And they wanted to do this as an example for this new church. Uh, this is the first child dedication in this church. And so they wanted uh, to be an example uh, for you, uh, the friends and people who are, who are coming to this church, of dedicating our <coughs> children to God. Hannah's reason is that Micah is God's child, and that's also their desire as well, that little Micah will be their child. Last night, there was a baptism, as we saw. Uh, Sam and James were baptised, and so this is sort of another part of church life and community life is dedicating of children. And so uh, that was another reason why uh, Roy and Jin Ha wanted to have uh, this special time, that, that, this is, that this church will be a family. And they desire uh, to let you know that dedicating your children is something that is important. And so that's another reason why they wanted um, the dedication to happen and be part of this community. A baby dedication is a celebration of thanksgiving for God, for the baby. But God has given us children, and so they would also like to give the child, Micah, back to God. Micah's life is dedicated to God's service. God's blessing is asked for Micah and for the family. And even though Micah is being dedicated, actually, uh, Roy and Jin Ha are also dedicating themselves. So we do not lightly dedicate our children because we are the ones who are dedicating ourselves and the ones who will be bringing up uh, the children. So why is it done in a church? Why couldn't I just go to Roy and Jinnah's house and you know, have a prayer, give a little speech? Why is it done in a church? The reason is you, you who are here, especially you that are members of this church, you are also part of this dedication that you will do your part to help Roy and Jin Ha to bring up Micah. And so in some ways, uh, those of us who are present are also dedicating ourselves uh, to the upbringing, the godly upbringing of Micah. Uh, you probably noticed before during the slideshow, it takes a village to raise a <coughs> child. Well, in our context, you know, it's a church community to raise a child. And so that is why we have a child dedication in a church rather than you know, just doing it privately uh, in a home. And so you as extended family, friends and church community are also dedicating yourselves. A dedication is not infant baptism, okay? Uh, Micah is not being forced to, to be baptised to join a church or anything like that. That is not what uh, dedication is about. When Micah is old enough, Micah will make his own decision uh, to join the church. So this is not like an <coughs> no, uh, infant baptism or something like that. This is purely a dedication, a public support uh, of dedication. And so um, Roy and Jin Ha have uh, prepared a short vow which they want to commit in front of you and in front of God. And so I'll read it and they'll uh, repeat after me and then we'll have the dedicatory prayer. Okay, we the parents of Micah Hajun Kim. We the parents of Micah Hajun Kim. We want for Micah to seek God with passion. We want for Micah to seek God with passion. To serve others with love. To serve others with love. And to respect self with humility. And to respect self with humility. Okay, so that's their uh, desire. At this time, we'll have a prayer of dedication. Uh, those that are able to kneel. Uh, let's kneel at this time and I'll see. Okay, my God. <laughs> Dear Father, we come here today to dedicate Micah Hajun Kim. Dear Father Roy and Jin Ha, the family, this church community, we come before you to dedicate ourselves to the godly upbringing of Micah. Dear Father, he is only a little boy now. Dear Father, we know that the times uh, of this world are not always the best. And uh, right now there seems to be you know, so many things that are happening in this world. But at this time, 
uh, Roy and Jin Ha, they desire that Michael will be a light in a dark place. And so, Father, they dedicate him to you at this time. Dear Father, we pray that you'll indeed <coughs> look, look down upon Micah and look after him. Of course, he has good parents, Father, but we also ask for you as the great God and also our Father in heaven to also uh, look after him and help him and nurture him. We also pray that you will help and nurture Roy and Jin Ha, who are the main ones who will be taking care of Micah that they will indeed bring him up as they have vowed for him to be brought up, to seek you with passion, to serve others with love, and to respect self with humility. Dear Father, Micah has come from a, a great home spiritually and through different members of the family in their names that they have desired to follow you and show their dedication to you. And so I pray, Father, that Micah will indeed follow in these great footsteps, that he will indeed be your light to the world. So we just want to dedicate little Micah, Father. Please be with him and watch over this young life, all of his life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Take this child and bring him up for God. Okay, I've just got one poem to close. <clears throat> don't step on the pansies don't step on the pansies the master gardener once said suffer the little pansies to grow in my garden then he handed me the spade take care till I return but God I don't know how I've never had pansies they are so tiny so frail trust me with a rose the thorns will protect you from my clumsiness Trust me with a tulip safely buried beneath the sod to spring forth in new blossom after a season of hardship. Trust me with an ivy vine whose tendrils will cling to other things for support. But God, pansies, they have no thorns, no bulb, no vine. Don't trust them with me. But the gardener would not listen. So I changed my prayer. Okay, God. I'll take care of the pansies, but tell me how. And God said, water them with love. Weed them with firmness and let them bask in the sunshine of your soul. Is that all? There is but one thing more you must remember. It is the way you care, the way you touch, that will produce the most precious blossoms. So walk gently among my little ones. Don't step on the pansies. Remembering the words of the Master Gardener, I go forth to begin my task, whispering this prayer. O oh God, give me light words, light hands and light feet, so I won't step on the pansies. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's stand for closing prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father, what a joyful day to see little Micah uh, being dedicated to you. Dear Father, I pray that you'll be with each one of us as we dedicate ourselves anew today. Pray, Father, that uh, you'll just watch over us and uh, just be with us, especially now as we go uh, into the discussion time. Pray that uh, you'll just guide our thoughts uh, and our discussions as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.